We begin a new series on BBC Two now. Over six weeks, Sir Roy Strong will explore royal gardens through the eyes of their creators and within the sweep of history. And he begins with the 17th century garden at Hampton Court. Henry VIII's and Hampton Court. Everyone knows the man and the palace, symbols of an era. It's one of the greatest of Tudor buildings, an architectural milestone. But during the 16th century, palaces were something else, visual expressions of the power of the monarchy. But palaces weren't just buildings, they were gardens too. And gardens, like everything else, are mirrors of an age, created as expressions of monarchical power and personal passion, reflecting changes in taste and design, modes and manners. They are, at the same time, the most fragile of all art forms. They could literally be swept away overnight. I wish I could show you Henry VIII's garden. It was here. It was the first great Renaissance garden in England. A forest of gilded, heraldic bees scattered through the flower beds. It still is here, but buried beneath at least three later royal gardens. And what about the gardens of our other monarchs? Charles II, that great womanizer. What were his gardens like? or extravagant George IV, or respectable Queen Victoria. That's what we're going to find out. We're going to explore four centuries of royal garden making, from Hampton Court to Highgrove. The most famous surviving royal garden ever created is Hampton Court, a mecca for tourists the world over. Even in the late 17th century, it was one of the wonders of Europe. A garden conceived a spectacle on a scale never seen in England before. The structure we see now was laid out in the 1690s by our first real royal gardening couple, Mary II and William III. He was the Stadtholder of the Netherlands and became King of Great Britain through his marriage. William was an astute politician and a brilliant soldier, leading his armies to victory over the French. He was a chronic asthmatic, so he chose Hampton Court as his main palace because his air was unpolluted and his flat terrain reminded him of his beloved Netherlands. They were a strangely contrasted couple. He, austere, brusque and taciturn, short in stature and with a stoop. Whereas she was not only taller, five foot eleven, but smiled upon all and talked to everybody. Mary was the popular one, a real Stuart with brown eyes and hair, a romantic chatterbox, but with a penchant for religion. Her judgment was reckoned to be exquisite. Together they shared a mutual passion for building, interior decoration, and above all for gardening, spending a fortune on all three. They began to demolish part of Henry VIII's old palace and replace it with one in the latest fashion designed by Sir Christopher Wren. The new gardens surrounding it were to be their supreme masterpiece. William and Mary inherited from her uncle Charles II one of the grandest set pieces of garden design in this country, the Long Water. It was completed in 1662 in a style which Charles had seen during his many years of exile in France. The palace was set as the focal point of a grand vista of water and trees. No less than 758 lime trees were planted along its mile length. 
In the 17th century, gardens assumed a political significance. They became one of the many means through which the monarchy projected its image. Gardens became huge, with every avenue converging on the palace, symbolizing the dominance of the monarch over not only his subjects, but the realm of nature. The gardens also reflected an increasingly elaborate court life. They were used as settings for splendid entertainments and to parade in. William and Mary's gardens were the supreme expression of all of this, reflecting their position as the leaders of Protestant Europe. The basic structure is here today. It's all the detail which has gone, but it was very different in the 1690s. A panoramic painting of the garden at the height of its splendor shows us exactly how fantastic it once was. From a distance it does look much the same. The long water, the avenues, the paths, but closer to it's not. In the fountain garden there were no less than 13 fountains, hugely extravagant, and the design is articulated by elaborate patterns. This is a garden whose essence is pattern, a bit like embroidery. By the palace facade are two magnificent urns. Sculpture and all forms of garden ornament was as important as plants. Beneath the king's apartments is another garden stretching down to the Thames with William's banqueting house beside the river. An essential part of the design here in the king's privy garden seems to be the dozens of small clipped trees and at the end ironwork screens which hold the garden in. These fabulous screens designed by the great Huguenot metal worker Jean Tijoux are still here, perhaps the greatest wrought ironwork to be found anywhere, celebrating the couple who commissioned them. And still by the Thames, William III's banqueting house, looking back to the Tudor age. The elegant dolphin fountain is where it always was, in Queen Mary's own garden, ready to hand for watering her most precious flowers. The most remarkable survival of all is the famous maize, looking very much as it did when it was planted. Two superb stone urns still stand sentinel. On both, the world of classical mythology parades in homage to the crown. And here too are the gravel walks on which the courtiers once strolled around the central fountain, focal point of the great garden William and Mary created. But sadly, so much has gone. There is only this one fountain now, and that hasn't even got a decent jet. And everywhere there's misplaced drab park benches and ugly litter bins. Grass has replaced those 17th century patterns. There are handsome flower beds in the Victorian style. A riot of colour, very different from what was once there. As for some of the other planting, the herbaceous board, as we know, it wasn't invented until the 19th century. This monstrous and ugly holly tree began its life as something very different. It was a beautiful, clipped five-foot cone, one of about a thousand pieces of topiary, which, dotted through these gardens, made up part of its essential design. The King's Privy Garden today looks simply terrible. It wouldn't surprise me if, if Tarzan swung by on a rope. Something has gone radically wrong here. None of the statue or the Tiju screens could be seen from the palace, ruining the original concept. These gardens were all meant to be looked down on to appreciate the geometric patterns. It's enough to make William and Mary, let alone poor Wren, turn in their graves.
Across the channel, the Dutch also have a palace built by William and Mary. Not as grand as Hampton Court. In fact, it began as a hunting lodge. It's called Hitler. Through its spectacular restoration, we can see almost exactly what Hampton Court looked like. It's as though the clock had stopped on the day William died. Nothing could be closer to the design and spirit of the original Hampton Court garden than this. Both gardens were constructed at the same time. They are the work of the same garden designer, Daniel Marrow, and in both, William and Mary's strong personal imprint is seen everywhere. A garden of this kind was conceived as a magnificent open-air room. Unlike at Hampton Court, at Hitlow, nothing obscures the view. The garden was designed to entertain in the grand manner and to impress not only William's subjects but also foreign visitors who must have been astounded to see such a garden. They would have marvelled at its expense in terms of men and money alone. Everything radiates from the palace with a central axis culminating in a fountain with a jet so high Every single thing in a garden of this kind, an expression of the Baroque age, is meant to be read and understood. The fountain with the baby Hercules strangling the serpent is our hero William III defeating his enemy, Louis XIV of France. The four great vases on the terrace symbolise the four countries over which he rules. In the central fountain, Mary too finds her place as Venus, goddess of love, but also, appropriately, of gardens. Everything is clipped, pleached and arranged in an absolutely balanced and symmetrical way. Outside the garden, everything seemed disordered and savage. Here the monarch was seen to tame nature, and by implication tame his subjects too, and bring order to the state. Even the waters that feed the canals and fountains are seen to flow from figures representing rivers over which William rules. This is indeed a different way of looking at a garden, a voyage into a vanished world, and a vanished world too of garden arts and crafts. To restore this garden, old skills had to be revived, like building a tunnel arbour and pleaching hornbeam up it. Fifteen years ago, none of this was here. At the beginning of the 19th century, Het Lowe was a landscape garden of grass and trees. Then, in 1977, they began to excavate and found William and Mary's buried garden. By 1984, it had been restored to its former glory. An enormous undertaking. What was the most important lesson that was learned? Hetlow's director. Well, we learned that authenticity is the most important thing. 
and to follow the exact the original drawings and plans and not to embellish them with your own fantasy and not to be influenced by taste or modern ideas about gardening or restoration because then you diminish the original relation with the 17th century. And that's very important because authenticity is an argument that goes through the years and fashion is only temporary. The lavish interior decoration of William and Mary has also been restored. The authenticity is as exact. Everywhere are echoes of the garden. Even in the decorations on the ceilings and fabrics of the beds. In the 17th century, house and garden were conceived as one. These same patterns are used in the most important garden element of this period. Something called a parterre. These dominate the design here. There are 18 of them. They were the major feature at Hampton Court too. What is a parterre? It's one of the great art forms of the 17th century. This particular example is an embroidered parterre, a parterre de broderie. It's like a huge patterned carpet rolled out across the ground. It was the height of garden magnificence. It evolved in France in the 1620s and 30s and exported all over Europe, including to Holland and England. Just imagine the skill in laying it out. At the centre there's a piece of finely clipped grass, then a great luxury. But the principal ingredient was dwarf box. In a way, it was instant gardening, for from the moment the box was planted, the effect of the patterns, the embroidery and flourishes could be seen. They used all sorts of materials as grounds for their parterres to emphasize the pattern. Marble chipping, broken bricks, shells, blue materials such as cobalt, any form of colored stone or earth, even coal dust for the black. The whole thing is contained in the ancestor of our modern herbaceous border, the plat bond. And this was the only part of the parterre that was meant to be seen from ground level. And here, for the first time, we see what we think gardens are really about. Flowers. Notice how it's made up. It's a strip of earth about three feet wide, held in by box hedges with a narrow strip of white sand to catch the box clippings. There are symmetrically placed clip yews and junipers to provide vertical accents to the composition. The earth is raised, a relic of medieval gardening. It's called the dodan, or donkey's back. The flowers are planted with what would seem to us very large spaces between them. This is exactly how the gardens at Hampton Court would have been planted. I asked Hetlow's horticultural consultant where she found authentic varieties. Actually, one has to compromise. There are very few of the real old varieties available to us. There are a few tulips that have withstood the times and are still bred by growers. But the other plants, we have to look for a form that looks exactly like they looked in the 17th century. The research comprised uh, looking at paintings, looking at lists of nurseries, and from all these sources, an enormous amount of plants came out that could be used. They had to be very ornamental. They were used as a kind of uh, exhibition in the garden. People were so scientifically interested in these new plants that why they planted them very wide apart. You had to see the, the entire plant. They were uh, grown in the nurseries and then taken out into the garden when they were at the most beautiful and then taken away again. The 17th century was the age of those lovely Dutch flower paintings, huge vases laden with luscious blooms. Under William and Mary, domestic floral decoration on this scale was a novelty. Their private rooms at Hedlow were filled with flowers. 
in guarding this ill-sorted couple came together in such a way that Daniel Defoe could write, their majesties agreed so well in their fancy that they ordered everything that was done. The results could be startling. Queen Mary managed to combine her passion for flowers together with her other one, the Delft blue and white china, in the creation of a new form of flower vase, the flower pyramid. These extravagant vases here in the Queen's Gallery at Hampton Court began as a special line made just for her. Just look at it. It's like some porcelain pagoda that's made to come to bits so that each tear could be filled with water and the nozzles crammed with flowers. And all sorts of flowers, not just tulips, grape hyacinths, fritillaries, even her beloved auriculars. In fact, whatever happened to be in season. Imagine 10 or 15 of these lining a room. It would be like a floral firework display. The Delphware in itself was expensive. So too, as we know, were the flowers. Just 40 years before in Holland, there had been something called tulipomania, when one single tulip bulb would have changed hands for over a thousand guilders, when one guilder would have bought you a dozen glasses and two a landscape painting. Throughout Hampton Court Palace, as it hit low, the interior decoration celebrates plants and flowers. The paintings and the carving in wood and stone record William and Mary's love of plants and the huge range that they grew here. aspect of garden design. The only plant element of their garden which still looks as they knew it is this. This is the most famous garden feature that Hampton Court has. The origins of mazes are lost in antiquity. They weren't just planted for fun, they were symbolic of the twists and turns in life. People of the Stuart age pace through them in contemplation not only of this life, but of the next. In this way, they combine prayer with something else we've forgotten about, walking. This maze is only a fragment of one of the grand set pieces of 17th century garden design, the wilderness. A wilderness does not mean a wild planting of flowering shrubs and bulbs. That's Victorian. No, in the 17th century, it was a huge area planted with hornbeam hedges as walls, forming corridors and rooms. There was at its centre a huge tree. Here courtiers could go for a very long walk indeed. It was the work of the man who designed the parterres, and most of the interior decoration, both here and at Hitlow, Daniel Marrow. We have the plan with all the details of the planting, the hedges, trees and shrubs dotted into it, everything which made up this remarkable composition. Today it's a dream in springtime, with a carpet of daffodils and narcissus, but for most of the year it looks not only unruly, but downright dull. If recreated, it would give us one of the great examples of a forgotten garden form. For this, we don't only have to rely on original designs and paintings. There are new scientific ways to help us. This is getting very low. Yeah, there's something, something there. Then it goes up again by about ten. It's still going, isn't it? We're still yeah, going across something. In the fountain garden, recitivity plots out what lies buried beneath the turf. It's a form of garden archaeology without excavation. 
mechanism is there. Another modern method is magnometry, which records the magnetic field of long-lost forms. Both machines throw up their results on a computer screen. And if you're blinded by science, there's this. And we get something there. And here. There. Yeah. Well, that, as far as we can see, is where the water came up. Now we're almost complete. Ted Fawcett's a garden dowser, and we're plotting where one of the 13 fountains was. We walk around. around. This is presumably yeah, the edge of the centre, and this is presumably the stone coping or whatever. With all these ways to accurately restore the gardens, I asked Hampton Court's director what their plans were. The restoration opportunities at Hampton Court are absolutely enormous. Unfortunately, over the years, there's been a great deal of alteration to the original layouts of the gardens, and there are certain options for restoration that we have before us. There are places such as the wilderness, and perhaps more particularly the Privy Garden, where there are very considerable opportunities for very interesting restoration. Clearly, an area like the one I'm standing in now, this great fountain garden, would be an enormously difficult task to try and restore. Well, I would restore the lot. We have Marrow's original design for the fountain garden, his masterpiece. What a challenge to put this back. We know it can be done, and I think it's important that we should. We have no single instance of a great parterre of this period left in Britain. And this was the most famous of them all. Restoration means change, losses as well as gains. It would mean axing those 300-year-old yew trees. I, for one, can't wait to start. It totally obscure ends magnificent facade and ruin the original concept. Some of them have already begun to die. Restoration is not a new idea at Hampton Court. They had a go in the 1920s with a Tudor knot garden. It's now inaccurately block planted in a very modern way. It should be sparingly filled with the flowers and herbs of Shakespeare's England. And there's a more recent, so called William and Mary garden. Nothing about it is accurate. The layout, the flowers, the colours, the density of the planting, everything is alien to the Stuart age. And look at these excruciating whimsy topiary figures. And whatever is this? The less said about that, the better, especially when we compare the quality of what survives from the original gardens. I think it's time we thought about Hampton Court in a different way, seeing what has been achieved at Hetlow. How magnificent it would be to see William and Mary's garden restored in all its splendour. Garden conservation and restoration is an invention of our own age. That's precisely what our contribution should be to the Royal Gardens of Hampton Court. You can see that programme again on Monday at 5.30 on BBC Two and next week a look at the royal inspiration behind Kensington, Frogmore and Kew. To accompany the series Royal Gardens, this BBC book, which would grace any coffee table, is in the shops now.
I renounce war and never again directly or indirectly. I renounce war and never again directly or indirectly. I renounce war and never again directly. Theos were ridiculed. Nothing would make me ashamed of my dad. I learnt to play and see the conquering hero comes, and he was, he was my hero. If you use violence to try and stop violence, you end up with more violence. The First World War had caused my father to sit crying in the corner of the kitchen. You don't stop wars by more wars. A testimony of peace. I renounce war in half an hour. First on two, a lighter side to the war and peace season. Posted to the front line and up to his knees in mud, Captain Blackadder is determined to get out of the mire and out of the war. 